Okay, guys, we have been talking about um, nationalism and sectionalism in class, okay? And we know that sectionalism is when the different regions kind of were pitted against each other or had tensions between each other where they were putting their own interests above the good of the nation. Today we're going to be talking about nationalism and the growth of nationalism in the country. And this um, goes with this handout, the branches of firm nationalism. And you can see that we have a lot to talk about here. So I'm going to go pretty quickly. You might want to go through this another time or two or pause uh, to do your writing. But I'm going to try and keep it down to, you know, 18 minutes or so. So we'll see if I meet my goal. Okay, um, let's head to the PowerPoint and see what we have to look at here. You'll notice that on your graphic organizer, I've broken the um, I've, I've broken the graphic organizer into the branches of government. So first, we're going to talk about the legislative branch, meaning Congress, and how they affirm nationalism during this time period. And then we'll be looking at the executive branch and the judicial branch. Okay. The big deal facing Congress that challenges uh, or brings up issues of nationalism versus sectionalism is the admission of a new state into the Union. And that new state is Missouri. And, you know, it's kind of like a baby's being born. Everyone should be excited about it. Missouri is right here. But actually, the admission of the state is going to cause quite a bit of consternation because Missouri is a, wants to be a slave state. And if Missouri enters as a slave state, that's going to throw off the balance of slave and free states. It may not look like it on this map, but the number of free states and the number of slave states is equal at this time. Okay, Some of these smaller states are, are, are in the north make it look like the south is much larger than the north in terms of number of states, but they're equal and in, in, in balance. And so if Missouri comes in as a slave state, it's going to make the um, slave states have more representatives in the Senate. And that throws off the balance um, of power in Congress at some level. So uh, the northern states are actually opposed to the Missouri Compromise. And they do not want Missouri to enter as a slave state. And so Congress has to figure out what to do so that the north and south aren't pitted against each other. What they agree on is the Missouri Compromise. Okay, The Missouri Compromise uh, says the solution. So right now you should be looking at solution um, in the middle of your handout. Um, Missouri is going to go ahead and enter as a slave state, but they're going to bring in another state up here, actually wasn't a state yet, Maine. They're going to bring Maine in as a free state, and therefore the balance will remain um, equal between free and slave states. And furthermore, they want to try and, and figure out what they're going to do about this in the future so we don't have to keep fighting about it. And we agree that what we should do is draw a line through the, 30, through the Louisiana Purchase. This right here is the Louisiana Purchase. And you can see that we draw a line right here. And it's agreed that everything north of that will be free and everything south of that will be slave. And therefore, we won't have to fight about this every time we have um, a new state coming into the Union. We hope to kind of make this a kind of permanent solution. Wow, I really need this to kind of tilt up like that. I wonder what I can do to pull that off. Let me see. Okay. Sorry for the turbulence. <laughs> okay. Is there a glare now? No, it's all right. So they drew a line, a 36-30 line. That's going to keep us from having to fight about slavery the whole time. So the question is, well, what does this have to do with nationalism? And the answer is that the North and the South agreed to compromise for the good of the nation above their own sectional interests. And so it shows how they were willing to come together for the good of the country as a whole. Okay? They could have each you know, gone, stayed on the extremes and kept just pushing their position uh, to the 100% uh, extremist point of view, but they decided, nope, let's compromise for the good of the country. Okay? 1820, Missouri Compromise. The country remains united, and um, wow, we've never had thunder in our Flash video before. That's pretty exciting. The next thing that, the next branch that has to think about nationalism or grows in nationalism during this time period is the executive branch. And this is the time when James Monroe is president, the era of good feelings, if you recall. And I want to just remind you of the playground analogy we've talked about before in class, the whole idea that we're still trying to get respect uh, from other nations on kind of the playground of nations. And it's during this time period that the executive branch moves us very much in that direction through several things. One is the Adams Onus Treaty. Um, the problem here is that Spain owned this land here in Florida, but they weren't policing it very well, and we had problems with pirates and all kinds of things. And um, so finally we're going to tell the Spanish that if they don't control their land, we're going to take it. And they agree to just hand it over to us. So it's kind of like we 
went up to Spain on the playground and told them they better give us their lunch money and they handed it over, which tells you that we do have some increasing power in the world. Okay? So that shows the growth of the prestige and power of our nation, which is another um, version of, of nationalism. Okay? So they're no longer willing to police it. They give it to us. We're cool. All right, the next thing is the Monroe Doctrine. We begin to be increasingly threatened by the fact that the Europeans seem to want to come in and recolonize certain areas of uh, our hemisphere. For example, the Russians want to come into uh, the uh, northwest region of our country, and Spain and Portugal tend to uh, be looking at places um, in Central and South America. So we decided it would be smart to just basically say that, um, no, that this whole continent here, not just the United States, but the whole continent is closed to further colonization. We kind of define our block, our neighborhood block, if you, uh, for example, and we kind of say, look, this is, our, this is our block. You're not allowed over here anymore. Don't come in over here causing trouble. Um, and so we kind of define our sense of uh, the territory that we're going to police, and it's even more territory than that which we directly control. So the Monroe Doctrine makes us the policemen of our whole hemisphere and therefore shows that we um, have a higher sense of power, uh, a heightened sense of power and resolve to um, be more of a force on the playground of nations. Okay? Finally, we have some treaties after the War of 1812. We've talked about these before, but they tend to demonstrate that we um, want to be respected. Uh, an example is the rush bagot Treaty, which was with Britain. It involves this area up here on the Great Lakes where we fought the War of 1812. And what it basically says is that we are not going to put warships on the Great Lakes, and that shows that the British were at least enough in intimidated enough by us that they felt like they didn't want to have to worry about us having warships on the Great Lakes. So um, that demonstrates a sense that we are a force to be reckoned with within the world, which raises our sense of pride and nationalism. And then next we have the Convention of 1818 with Britain. This came after... Uh, uh, the War of 1812, and it set our northern border with Canada up here at the 49th parallel, and that helped clarify where we, our land ended and where British land began, and so therefore made it easier for us to defend ourselves and defend our border, which gives us a sense of increased identity, like, this is us, we're proud of us, don't tread on us, don't come over here, there's going to be a rumble, Okay. And then we also had the Oregon Territory um, Treaty, where this land here we had shared with Britain. This is um, Washington State and modern-day Oregon. Um, we had shared this land with Britain, but we decide by this time period that um, we're going to box the Spanish out, and just us and the British are going to control it. And that shows that they respect us enough to share something with us. They consider us to be equals. So that raises our sense of kind of like we're one of the big kids on the playground because now... Uh, Britain, bully Britain, is uh, kind of sharing their sandwich with us. Okay? All right, now we're moving on to the judicial branch, and um, let me check my time. Oh, yeah, we're doing okay. We're on eight minutes. So the judicial branch is a really interesting um, example of how nationalism grows, but this is a different kind of nationalism, so let me just review the types of nationalism again. Okay, you have one form of nationalism is the central or national government grows in its power over the states. That's the kind of nationalism the judicial branch is about to exhibit, is that the central government is going to become more powerful than the states. The other two kinds of nationalism focus on like, national pride or um, a sense of one's like, identity as being an American. Like We're increasingly starting to identify ourselves as a unique type of people called Americans. Um, so those are kinds of flavors of nationalism. So let's talk about the, national, the nationalism one with the judicial branch. It's kind of like a, um, we've talked about this before, the orphan analogy. Okay, the orphan analogy is the idea that um, the federal government is the parent and the states are the children. And the states had relative autonomy. They were kind of orphans from 1776 until 1783 um, and really 1789 because the Articles of Confederation period, the states were still very powerful. So basically from 1776 until 1789, the states have basically done whatever they wanted. They were like orphans without parents. And now they've gotten new parents. Their parents are the federal government. And the federal government's trying to come in and tell them what to do, and they're just kind of like, whatever, dude, we run our own business around here. You can't tell us what to do. So the, the states are having a hard time realizing that there's a new parent in town, and they're strict parents, and they're going to make the states behave, and they're going to punish them and hold them accountable. So um, these court cases we're about to talk about are all that brand of nationalism, where the, the national government is disciplining the states, telling them what they can and can't do, and basically asserting their power as, like, the supreme parent within the 
a United States family. Okay? So, that being said, let's look at what happens. Oh, that's a pretty sharp angle here. The first uh, court case is called Gibbons versus Ogden. And if you've ever been on a ferry, you know what the goal of a ferry is. When, we, when my family drives to New Jersey, we take a ferry sometimes where we take a boat, we put our car on a boat, and we go across this like little isthmus right here so that we don't have to drive all the way around. Well, there was a ferry back then between uh, New Jersey and New York. It went like this, okay? And one guy uh, had a permit from the state of New Jersey to run this ferry, and the other guy had a permit from the federal government to run this ferry. And they both thought that they had an exclusive right to run this route. And so every time they saw the other guy's boat going by, taking passengers from New York to New Jersey in this quick fashion, they would, like, yell at each other, like, Hey, you're not supposed to be doing this route. I got a license to do this route. So they sue, okay? And uh, I believe it's Gibbons. Well, yeah, Gibbons sues Ogden, and Gibbons is the one who thinks Ogden's New Jersey permit is not valid and therefore should not be upheld. So the question is, who really can give out these permits to run this route? Okay, so two men try and run a ferry service, so they're trying to move people between New York and New Jersey quickly over water on boats. One guy has a state permit and says only he can run that route, and the other guy says that's not right, that the state permit is not valid. So, the other guy says only the federal government can regulate trade between states, and therefore that state permit isn't going to work. So, what did John Marshall's court rule? Now, remember, John Marshall is from what political party? Mm, Democratic, Republican? Republican, or? Ah, he's a federalist. Federal, national, central government, federalist. So, you probably have a sense of how this is all going to work out. Only the federal government can regulate trade between states, not the states. He looks in the Constitution, and in the Constitution it says, only the federal government can control trade between states. If the trade takes place within a state, it goes from a neighborhood in New York to a neighborhood in New York, no problem. The state permit holds up. But you can't control trade between states with a uh, state permit. Why is this nationalism? This is nationalism because it's an example of the national government telling the states what they can and can't do. So again, they're disciplining the states and making national power be respected. Okay? The next court case is McCuller versus Maryland. Okay? Um, imagine in this case, uh, let's do a modern example real fast because sometimes I think those are easier for my students to understand. Let's just say, let's just pretend we know this isn't the case, but let's just say that everyone in North Carolina hated abortions, that we were all a pro-life state, every single one of us, okay? But the federal government says that it's le safe and legal to have an abortion. So what if we all got together in North Carolina and we passed a state law that said, hey, we're going to have an abortion tax, an abortion center tax. And you can have an abortion in North Carolina and there can be abortion clinics, but every clinic has to pay a billion dollar tax a year. Are there going to be any abortion clinics in North Carolina? No, there are not. Okay? Because it'd be too expensive. By the time the clinic paid the billion dollar tax, the amount, the amount of money they'd have to be charging for their services would be so extreme that no one would have an abortion here. They would go to Virginia or Kentucky or wherever that might have a more reasonable um, fee. So basically what the states are trying to do is nullify federal law by taxing it, taxing away federal law. And that's exactly what was going on in this time period in Maryland, except it wasn't about um, abortion at all, of course. It's a bit of a modern example, but not, uh, not one that actually happened, but just a hypothetical. Um, in this case, it's a national bank. Maryland hates the national bank, and um, they don't want the national bank at all, so they come up with a special bank tax to try and get rid of the national bank using their power to tax. So the question is, can the state do this? Can they basically tax away federal law, nullify federal law by using their power to tax? What do you think? You should know the answer to this by now. Federalist, right? So um, can the states nullify federal law? Mm, oh, the cashier. Ca oh, the cashier is McCullough. And he's suing the state of Maryland saying, heck no, I'm not paying the tax. So, of course, what does Marshall rule? He says, the states cannot nullify federal law. Okay? They can't tax away federal law, and so they limit the state's ability to tax. Okay? I know you got that right. I know you did. Yeah. Because, you know, he's a federalist. Have I said that before? I think I have. Okay. All right. Next court case. Oh, this is nationalism? Why is this nationalism? Because the federal government is telling the states what they can and cannot do. Okay? 
Fletcher versus Peck. Now, we all know that contracts are really important for keeping society going, okay? Probably the earliest contracts you're going to sign when you um, start your autonomous life away from your parents is like cell phone contracts or apartment contracts. And here's the deal. Once you sign a contract, you can't get out of it unless both sides agree to let you out of it. Okay? We all know if you break your cell phone contract, your, your apartment contract or whatever, that if you do it and they don't agree to let you out of it, that you have to pay a penalty. Okay? So the key to financial transactions for people being willing to take a risk on other people and their promises is that they have contracts. Okay? So contracts are the basis for our financial system in America. Okay? Well, in this case, the states were signing contracts, but then they were breaking them, and no one was letting the states, uh, no one was making the states stop doing this. Okay? So... We know that contracts are key to financial transactions in the economy, that basically they keep the economy running and get people to take risks and, and loan to each other and provide services over time to each other. Individuals cannot break contracts by law, and if you break a contract, you have to pay the penalty outlined in the contract. But the states are breaking contracts, and they basically have been getting away with it because if you sued the state, if you sued the state for breaking the contract, guess who runs the courts? The state. So is the state going to find themselves guilty in their own courts? No. So this Fletcher, dude, uh, this Fletcher guy is smart. He goes and says, I'm going to sue the states in the federal courts and make the federal court kind of like tattletale to the federal courts and say, the states aren't upholding their contracts. You ought to do something about it, federal government. And um, so he basically tattles on the states to John Marshall. And there's a reason he tattles to the states to John Marshall, because by now, people have a pretty good sense that John Marshall has um, very little tolerance for the state's misbehavior. Okay? So the question is, should the federal government allow the states to um, break these contracts? What did John Marshall's court rule? I think you probably know. I hope you know by now. The states cannot break contracts they make with people because they have to uphold contracts just like individuals. And why is this nationalism? It's nationalism because the federal government is growing in its power over the states, telling them what they can and can't do. Okay? That is Fletcher versus Peck. The last court case is Dartmouth versus Woodward, and oh, this is a very cool story. Okay, so in 1793 in North Carolina, the, the state legislature decides to start the first public university in the whole country. Okay? No more private school stuff, no Harvard, no Yale, whatever. We're going to let all the people... Be a, be a benefit and attend the state university. It's called the U University of North Carolina at uh, Chapel Hill. And um, it's really cool. 1793, it starts, oldest. So all the other states that are like up north and have private schools, they're all kind of jealous. They're like, wow, what a progressive, great idea to like raise the educational level of your citizens. We wish we would have done that. So what some of them try to do, particularly Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, they say, hey, we'll just turn our private school into a public school, which sounds like a totally great idea unless you're on the board of trustees of the private school and you have all this power and authority and, uh, and tradition as a, pri as a private school. You're not going to be very happy about this whole transition idea. So in terms of what you need to remember or write down, what um, Dartmouth versus Woodward basically says, uh, the background is that the state of New Hampshire said that Dartmouth College could be established as a private college. But then the um, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill was founded, and everyone got all jealous of how cool we were. So then New Hampshire was jealous and wanted to make Dartmouth public, like the UNC Chapel Hill was. And so the board of trustees at Dartmouth get mad, and they sue and say that the original charter for the school was a contract that the state issued and that it must be upheld. All right, I know that's a lot to write, so you might want to pause that, but I can't delay because I'm almost at 20 minutes. Ah! What did Marshall's court rule? What did Marshall's court rule? Hopefully you know by now. He said, ah, 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 states. States cannot break contracts they make with corporations either. Okay, so Fletcher versus Peck says states can't break contracts with individuals, and Dartmouth versus Woodward says states can't break contracts they make with corporations, which are kind of like fake big people. Okay, why is this nationalism? Because the national government is telling the states what they can and cannot do. Okay? So, whew, hopefully now you've got a sense of how, in this time period, each branch of government was growing the, gov the government's power, growing the power of the national government over the states, um, making us a bigger player on the playground of nations, 
Um, and so this is really a period of intense nationalism in the United States. And um, that's the takeaway message. Okay? Tally-ho, good children. I will see you in class.